Well, let's open our Bibles up to Romans chapter 6. Happy Palm Sunday. That phrase is powerful, isn't it? He is God. You know, to those who don't know the Lord, that's the message that he has, that he is God. For those who do know the Lord and are rejoicing and experiencing the blessings of God, that's the message, that he is God. And for the believer who is struggling and their walk with God, that's the message that he has for them, for us. He is God. And it's exciting to be in Romans chapter 6. I was so excited. I know Brian was going to be gone and figured out I was going to get to teach Romans chapter 6. And then this morning it was like, oh my goodness, I'm going to be teaching Romans chapter 6. It's so heavy, but it's so wonderful. Uh, and the Lord wants to show us that He's God continuously. You, you know, throughout uh, this study in, in Romans, we've seen very clearly how Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and those opening chapters uh, reveals that to, to all those who, uh, or to all, we stand before a holy, righteous, just God, and all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all stand before Him with, with nothing to offer, and it's, it's that's one thing to know that, but then to know that and experience and, and understand that we have nothing to offer God to remove the consequences of sin, the guilt, the shame, the judgment. We have nothing to offer to God but what He offers to you and I and what we have received in salvation in the name of Jesus. You know, we've all missed the mark. we missed the standard for God's living. And what is that standard? Well, it's perfection. But glory be to God, he's given us the precious blood of Jesus. And then following then in like Romans chapter 3 leading up through, you know, what we'll see today that uh, the Apostle Paul clearly, again, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, explained what the doctrine or the theme of justification and so much needed, right? We need to understand that when we came to God, and we confessed our sin, and we received salvation, and the Lord, He's justified us. He has declared that we are righteous, and all of our sins have been cast away, never to be against us or to, to be a charge against us. And uh, awesome, the, the doctrine of justification. And remember, justification is the act of God declaring us righteous. Now, that kind of brings us to Romans chapter 6, and through Romans chapter 6 through Romans chapter 8, we're going to see the doctrine or the theme of sanctification. And I love sanctification. I love talking about and looking at the scriptures and what justification is, but sanctification is wonderful because it's the application of us being justified. It's the actual practical side of our walking with God. So justification is the act of, you know, us being declared righteous, and then it speaks of our position with God, that we are made right with Him through the blood of Jesus. And then sanctification is the practical walking out holiness, and that comes from the very moment that we were declared righteous until we go home to be with the Lord. When we're in glory, we'll be totally sanctified, but you and I know that we're Things aren't perfect even as we've come to the Lord, right? And we're going to see just again, Romans chapter 6. The goal of justification is sanctification. It is the will of God, as Paul said in Thessalonians uh, chapter 1, verse 4. I'm sorry, chapter 4, verse 3. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. And of course, the will of God, your sanctification, and the church at Thessalonica, they came out of that, the sexual immorality. But the will of God for all of us, sanctification, to walk in holiness, to be separated from the world unto God. And so that brings us to Romans chapter 6, verse 1. 
What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And again, as was pointed out last week, chapter divisions were, you know, that was not of the Lord put in for, for, for us to understand better. But we have to connect the, the previous two verses here with the thought of what Paul said there in verse 1. So go back to Romans chapter 5, verse 20. It says, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So Paul's not trying to be tricky here. He's not, you know, the Lord's not trying to be cute and trip anybody up in any way. But it's being pointed out, this is vital for us to understand, especially, folks, living in the days that we're living in. You know, part of our foundations of faith, uh, excuse me, foundations of discipleship on Tuesday night, these, we're covering these very things on, on how to live God's way compared to man's way, and to take it e even further, how to minister from the Word of God in the days that we're living in. Because there's so much influence from the world and man's way that contradicts God's way, leading to man not being truly set free. And God wants us to be set free. And we're going to see how to be set free. And it, <laughs> this is going to be like a broken record this morning, our relationship with Jesus. That's just not a cliche for us to use. What's it mean, a relationship with Jesus? It is so powerful. We sang this morning, the powerful name of Jesus. His name is powerful for who he is and what he's done. And we grow in the true grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and we continually are set free, walking in this sanctification, walking in holiness. But it's very clear how, how the Lord, uh, His Holy Spirit, leading Paul to systematically putting these things out for us to build that foundation leading up through chapter 7 and through chapter 8. See, the challenge for me is, is not to try and teach these next few chapters all in one day. We've got to stick to the Scriptures. So we've got to See how Paul laid this out. And he's wanting believers to have a full and complete understanding of these spiritual truths, again, that we would be more like Jesus. Essentially, that's what sanctification is, to become more like Jesus in our walk, being conformed to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. So Paul understood then, getting back to the text, Paul understood that there would be those that, as he would preach grace or teach grace, that there were those would be, okay, so if God's grace is abounding and he's able to forgive of any sin and God's always full of grace, then why not just live the lifestyle according to the old sin nature? And Paul's saying, that's not it. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace abound? Is he saying, go ahead, go ahead and sin because God's going to forgive you? Go ahead and live according to the way that you used to live. Go ahead and live according to the nature that we uh, are born into. And Paul's saying, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And then he answers this question, certainly not. How shall we who died to sin any longer in it? Now, this is interesting. In the Greek, he's speaking, it's, it's like I get the picture of now's the time to pound the pulpit, like those older, wonderful preachers used to do. I don't want to break the pulpit here. You know, I'd hate for Brian to come back in the pulpit, not here. So, but Paul's saying, certainly not, absolutely not. Don't even let the thinking of that enter into your mind. And we've got to confess today, we hear this, that, you know, greasy grace, that I can live the, however I want to because the Lord's loving, he's forgiving, he's full of mercy, he certainly will extend his grace to me. That's not what Paul's teaching here. And God forbid if that does enter our mind because the standard is God and his holiness. His standard is always holiness. Now, I'm going to share something with you. Don't throw anything at me. And I've used it before, too. Well, we all struggle. 
we all struggle, and believers struggle. We all struggle with something. We always got something we're entangled with. That might be have some truth to it, but we have to remember the standard is God's holiness, always. Before we came to Christ, and as we walk with Christ, His standard is holiness. It's perfection. We're called to be holy because He is holy. But we can't, right, because we still battle. But I don't think we, it, it's, a, it, it's a thing of the world, I guess some influence from the world's teaching, that we all struggle. Again, the perfection's holiness, and we get to see these next few chapters how to go about that, how to walk in this holiness. But Paul's wanting us, the Lord's wanting us to understand that his grace will be poured out. There is no sin that will keep man away from him. But we're declared righteous to walk in holiness. And look what it says here. Certainly not. How shall we, who's he speaking of there? Believers, we, those who have confessed the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, how shall we who died to sin any longer in it? And died to sin, live any longer in it. Died to sin. It's pointed out here, died to sin, and it's in the past tense. That means it's pointing to a specific time of occurrence. The very day that you confess Christ as Lord, admitted that you were a sinner, believed in him, confessed, that very moment of conversion, you were dead to sin. It's interesting in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, that we go to often in our study of Romans. And you, he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. And for context, I put in there, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. So Romans, two, or, uh, Romans 6, 2 tells us we were dead to sin, or we are dead to sin. But in Ephesians chapter 2, we were um, you know, dead in sin. Right? Before God, we are dead in sin. But now after coming to Christ, we are dead to sin. Big difference, amen? And we had that but God experience. Turn with me, and I love the fact that the Bible, again, especially going through these vital truths, the Bible is the best commentary that we have. Uh, Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to a cross, to the cross. And so that very day that we came to Christ, our sins, it's finished. We are dead to sin. He'll never hold that against us again because we're covered with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. But also, we have to understand as we go through this scripture that being dead to sin, it also takes us that we are also dead to the power of sin. What is the power of sin? Well, before we came to Christ, it's the power unto death, judgment before God, being separated with him. But now as we come as a believer, sin has no power over us because we are dead to sin. Amen? Amen. Okay, so look at verse 15. I know it's not up there uh, of Colossians 2, but having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them in it. That is so powerful of what took place at the cross. Now, the enemy can still tempt us. And we're still going to sin as believers, but we are dead to sin. The power of sin, 
I had my pastor, he used to bring up uh, when we first got saved. Who remembers Flip Wilson? Don't raise your hand, you'll show your age. But, you know, he always had the devil on one side and one on, you know, the angel on the other, and you had to go back and forth and listen to it. Well, as a uh, non-believer, you could say, well, the devil made me do it, right? There's some truth in that. But as a believer, we have no right to say that the devil made me do it because the devil has no power over us. When we sin as believers, it's by choice. We choose to sin. And nowhere in here are we going to be sinless. That's, that's not what Paul's sharing here. Continue on then with this thought. Verse 3. Or you, do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. Wow. Or do you not know? In the Greek here, this Greek word to know speaks of not being ignorant of something. Paul's clearly wanting this truth to be understood, that sin has no power over the believer. And what is used here is baptism. And I do believe that this Baptism that Paul was talking about, although it's identifying and illustrating a water baptism, the actual baptism is a spiritual baptism that takes place in the heart when a believer comes to God. It is a baptism. Baptism, a spiritual baptism, uh, which again takes place at the very moment a person commits. Now that's an important word for us, commit. If we would look at John 3.16, we know this scripture, right? Of course we do. Of course we do. (laughs) And let me read it to you. John 3.16, for God so... Yeah, say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have lasting life. (laughs) The enemy, I tell you. Key word here is believes. Oh, so much, so many important words, but it's important that word believe, it's not just an intellectual belief. The word believe there in the Greek is speaking of a a commitment. You're turning your life over to to, to God because you believe that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's a turning over. It's a commitment. And when one does that, not just believing in the mind, but one commits himself or herself to God, that spiritual baptism takes place. Uh, you know, the definition of baptism being immersion or uh, overwhelming of, of something. And again, Paul here is pointing to that commitment in Christ, which is uh, so powerful for us to remember. It's so powerful for you and I to remember our conversion experience. You know, Paul likened to it in, in Ephesians that the very same power that resurrected Jesus Christ from the dead is the very same power that resurrected you from the dead. And if that same power was willing, uh, able to resurrect us from the dead, is he not able to lead, guide, direct us, and keep us from stumbling, to walk in his grace? Again, we also see here the, the picture then of water baptism, which, again, some of you will get baptized here next week, and we're looking forward to that. But to understand the actual, you know, that water baptism doesn't save anybody. The water is not cleansing anybody of, of any sin. The only, the only thing that can take away our sin is the blood of Jesus Christ. But the wonderful picture of water baptism, identifying with Christ, because when we're dead to sin, and this is Paul's point, is that we're identifying with Christ. As we... Standing up a sinner before God and being buried just as Christ was buried, 
and then being raised to the newness of life, a resurrection of newness of life. It's a picture of what has already taken place in the heart. And of course, water baptism is a form of obedience to God as Jesus was baptized as an example for you and I, for all believers, and to, to profess Christ before man. And Jesus said uh, he would you know, confess us to the Father for those who uh, confess him before man. And so it's an, it's an act of obedience, but the actual baptism's already taken place in the heart. The conversion has taken place in the heart. The, the person is born again because of the spiritual baptism, not that of water baptism. But water baptism is vital. And we look forward uh, to next week when, when some of you are, are, uh, will be baptized. We also know that wonderful picture of coming out of the water we are created new. Remember 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Again, how vital is this to not only know intellectually, but have in our heart? Well, as we're going to see, it's so vital as we go through the Christian life, that doesn't mean everything's easy. Unfortunately, I heard a story this week. There's a pastor um, recently said that he had not sinned in eight years. <laughs> I need to talk to him. Two reasons. One, if he didn't sin in eight years, I want to know how he's doing it. And two, we need to get in the Bible. We do struggle. We sang this morning, the battle belongs to the Lord. It is a spiritual battle between the flesh and the spirit. We have to acknowledge that. But how do we go forward in victory? What do we do to gain victory? Well, we have already received victory. And I love our study in the book of Joshua on Wednesday nights because so many principles in Joshua just line up right with the book of Romans. And God does that, doesn't he? And just with Joshua and the Israelites, God gave them the, the land of Jordan. Uh, the land of Canaan, the land of milk and honey, and it's theirs. They, they just needed to go in and, and, and take it. It's the same way with you and I. There's nothing holding us back. The devil cannot hold us back from walking in victory. And we have to keep that in our mind and our heart to claim that, to claim the land that God has given to us. And what's his desire? His desire is that we would live in victory. Our promised land isn't necessarily heaven. We have that waiting for us, yes. But he desires for us to live in victory on, in this land that we live in. So we are made new. And I'm reminded of Galatians chapter 3, verse 27. Again, this is Paul. For as many of you as were baptized in Christ have put on Christ. Again, it's an identification that Paul is speaking of here. And water baptism, it's, again, illustrating that spiritual identification that's already taken place in the heart. And then what about Galatians 2.20? I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, leave that up there for a minute, because this is so powerful especially when it's on a big screen, you can see it. When we go through struggles in this life, spiritually, how often does the enemy want us to be striving for that victory? And instead of saying, I have been crucified with Christ, we're thinking, uh, I've got to do this and this and this to get to that victory. And Paul's showing us, this is the way. I have been crucified with Christ. It's not, no longer I who live. And we're going to pick up more of that in Romans here. But that's a powerful scripture um, of having our life crucified with Christ. Verse 5. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. And there's that word for again which is a conjunction. And when Paul uses that here, as we've seen throughout the book of Romans, he's, he's wanting to give uh, further explanation or intensified explanation. 
And he's saying here, justification by faith is not just a legal transaction between God and man that God provides for man. It's relationship. Taking or having come to him and receiving the free gift of salvation in Christ Jesus, we identify in his death upon uh, that reception. And, you know, our, our resurrection and death also points that we will be resurrected in him. And certainly we have that wonderful promise found throughout the scriptures that we do. We have an inherited that resurrection blessing, that we will be resurrected in heaven with him. But Paul's mindset here and what the Lord would have us to clearly understand and it just separates religion, right? We're, we oftentimes say it's, it's not religion, it's about relationship. Again, we use that and it just means so much more than probably sometimes that when we say it. Relationship. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 3 or read it on the screen. Certainly when we come to Christ, our sins are forgiven. As we've read here already in these first opening verses of Romans chapter 6, there, there, there's something spiritual that took place, that we are dead to sin because Christ is dead to sin. And now he also makes us alive, and this is, this is the promise. And, and, and all through the scriptures we see, especially Paul explaining these things. Verse 1 of Colossians chapter 3, If then, and it should read, since then, this is the meaning, since then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also appear with him in glory. You always got to include Verse 4, with those first three verses. What do we see here? Well, this is the relationship that has taken place at conversion, that, that we are united with, with Jesus. Not only in his death, but we here on earth, it should be our desire to live the resurrected life in Christ. What's the meaning of, of our life being a Christian? Well, we're to live the resurrected life. And oftentimes when we get in trouble or we start to go astray, it's because obviously our relationship is something conflicting in our relationship with the Lord, maybe sin. But we have to go back to our wanting to please God, the relationship between God and man. And we learn this from Jesus himself, his love and desire to please the Father. If we're identified with Christ and being dead to sin because Christ, you know, took away death's power and, and the power of sin, then we too can apply that to our life and pleasing, pleasing the Father through Jesus. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Let's, uh, how about Second Peter? Chapter 1. Again, these are foundational verses. We certainly go over on Tuesday nights, but foundational verses when we recognize the powerful thing that we have in a, a relationship with God and what it means spiritually and what it means to apply to our lives that we go through this life in struggles. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God, of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises." that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And so this knowing here in knowledge in verse 2, it speaks of experiential knowledge. 
And that's, again, powerful for you and I to understand. And this is, a, again, a foundational passage of Scripture that we must constantly apply to our life. Let me put it this way. It says here, God says in His Word that He has given to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Do you believe that? On that alone, that alone, we must recognize sin has no power over us. Because he's given us everything as believers. He's given everything to you and I through himself, through his spirit, through his word. Everything in our relationship that we have in him, there is nothing that can hinder us in our walk with the Lord. That goes back to when we sin, it's a choice. But praise God for his Holy Spirit, that when we do sin, he what? He brings conviction. He, he, he brings us back to the Lord. Now, how does this all play out? Well, come back the next few weeks as we go through, but we got a few more verses. Again, the challenge of not teaching all of Romans 6, but go to verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. So again, we have to, you know, we have to chew on these things because that we see throughout Romans, Paul doing this. He's laying it out. I think of, um, uh, you know, a cow. I forget how many stomachs a cow has, but a cow chews the cud. How many? Four? Five? We don't know. We, you get the point. I'll go with Jessica. Uh, but chewing the cud, we got to chew on these things. We have to learn these things. That's in the Word of God. We learn these things. And Paul here, knowing it's the process, again, same knowing that we see in 1 Peter chapter or 2 Peter chapter 1, and the Lord's telling you and I, the Spirit of the Lord telling you and I, we must learn by experience to be dead to sin. And that comes through a walk with Him and our relationship with Him. Being in his word. And it's so true. It's so vitally true for you and I to apply to our lives. See, the danger for you and I as we go out and we share the gospel and people come to the Lord, what's the first thing we want to do for them? Because you're Calvary Chapel folks, right? The movement. What we want to do is we want to get a Bible in their hand, and they should get a Bible in their hand. But that's not enough, right? That's not enough. We've got to help them out and to teach I am so thankful to be part of a teaching movement. It's not just reading the Word of God, handing them a Bible, but to teach them the Word of God, just like the Holy Spirit teaches us when we get into the Bible. And then God enables us and trusts us, not just pastors, but all of us getting into the Word, that we might pass it on, the Word of God, its meaning, its application. And it'll, you want to know what God is like, we need to be in His Word. You want to know what you're like? Be in the Word because God tells us what our issues are and then He helps us by His Spirit that we can get corrected and we can walk with Him and receive the blessings that He desires to pour out. But how do we do this? Well, turn with me to Ephesians 4 or look on the screen. Again, more foundational verses for us to chew on. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 20. See, here's another thing why it's so important to be in the Word of God, because if we're trying to live the Christian faith out, the walk with God without His Word, it becomes nothing more than emotions and feelings. And I don't know about you, but my feelings change day to day. Today it's pretty good because the sun's shining. I'm here with you. But our emotions change. Look what the word says here in Ephesians 4, verse 20. And Paul's saying to those wonderful believers at Ephesus, But you have not so learned Christ. Again, that connects us right with knowing then back in verse 6 of Romans. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, 
and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. The old man here, connecting with what Paul's saying in Romans 6. The old man, the old, the old way that we live, the old conduct. What's he say? Well, we are to, to put it off. It's like taking off the old clothes and putting on new clothes. There has to be a willingness. We talked about this last Tuesday night. When, when you came to the Lord, wasn't it wonderful when the Lord, just by His power and His great love, He, he just like took sin from you, right? Some of those sins, it was just, He took. He just, nope, that's not you anymore. But then there's these other things that He says, okay, by faith, you're going to trust me. And I'm sure all of us have some stories and how God's worked. But see, we're, we experience the grace of God. We experience the resurrected life. Experience these things that Paul's speaking of here. The old man, we're to, to cast off the old man. Not the old nature, our old conduct, the way we lived. And it says there, be renewed in the spirit of your mind in Ephesians. That really speaks of being spiritually transformed. It's not about willpower. Again, if we're not in the Word and if we're trying to go by our feelings and emotions that change all the time, it's going to be nothing but willpower. Um, by will and determinations, I'm going, to, I'm going to follow the Lord. Well, the Lord doesn't work that way. The Lord desires that we trust Him, be obedient with the things that He teaches us, and experience His power, and we walk in that wonderful grace. And we receive the blessings again in, in fellowship with God. And he goes on to say in Ephesians there, put off or put on the new man. That's the wonderful truth about God. As he calls us to, to be rid of the old man, he has a way of filling us up to live this new life that he desires for us to live as, as believers. And the amazing thing is, some of us, we walk with the Lord for many years. But it doesn't matter. There's always, there's always more steps to be taken with the Lord to grow in him. And again, that's a trick of the enemy that even looking at the Bible, well, I've read Genesis to Revelation. I'm good. No, you're not. <laughs> the Lord wants you to go back and read more, get into his word, because it's a living organism. And our relationship with God, again, it's the spiritual nature. Like in First, uh, Second Peter chapter 1, uh, the divine nature. We are partakers of divine, divine nature with, with, with God through Jesus. And then in verse, uh, it says... <clears throat> Verse 6, to be done away with. That is, that the body of sin might be done away with. So the old, the old way, the old conduct, our bodies are instruments of sin, for sin. That doesn't mean our body in itself is sin. It means that our conduct trained our bodies to sin. But at the same time, as we put off the old man, and put on the new man, we are trained in righteousness. And uh, that, again, is so powerful as we go through these things and relate to our walk with the Lord. That we reckon, as we'll see, reckon that we're dead to sin. And if we truly believe that he's given us everything to, to life and godliness, then we're not going to think about well, I need a little bit more of this. I need a little bit more of that. You know, Paul said that his grace is sufficient. In weakness, he is strong. And that's a challenge for us believers today living in the world that we're living in because it's not easy. We're living in, as you know, critical times in history, but we also have the blessed hope that Jesus is coming. Amen? And we want to stand before him. We want to please Him. That's God's way to live in a way that pleases Him. And turn to Him. He, he gives us the power to do so. Verse 8 says, Now if we died with Christ, since we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over Him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. 
So again, this is translated since. Since you've died with Christ, we identify with Christ. And the word knowing here, again, this is three times, right, with the word know. I think the Lord's showing us He wants us to know these things and understanding. The know here is fullness of knowledge. The Lord is wanting us to know that sin has no power over us. It's just not mouthing at. We can say that a thousand times, but if we don't believe in our heart, we don't believe it. You know, positive confession will, movement will take these things and twist and turn them. Paul, through the Spirit of God, is teaching the church, and the Holy Spirit is teaching you and I that sin has no power over us. Therefore, we walk in that. And it's the life, the life, the life, life of Christ, the resurrected life. Paul said this in Philippians 3, verse 10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. And we remember what Philippians 3 is all about, right? That Paul gave his testimony, shared how he came to the Lord. And this is his life now, the fellowship of with the Lord Jesus Christ. And he understood that in his life, his life, he's crucified with Jesus. That is the power to live, not for the resurrection to come, but the resurrection of newness of life on this earth. Jesus said this in verse uh, chapter 10 of John, verse 10. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Life in Him. Jesus came that we might have this relationship with Him and the power of Him in our life. As Jesus is dead to sin, you and I are dead to sin. Verse 11, Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead, indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So Paul has, you know, clearly identified our, our position with God. And now we're going to be, in the, again, the next few chapters of how does that play out in practical life. And, and here's, he says, reckon yourselves. Reckon means, it's an accounting term, meaning, you know, added to one's account. We can take it to the bank. Reckon. Sin has no power over you. Again, when we sin, it's a willful choice. We can't say the devil made me do it or my kids made me do it. God forbid we ever say that. (laughs) Or my wife or husband made me do it. Sin has no power. And it's a wonderful thing when we, when we reckon that and we live with this and knowing that sin has no power over us so that when I do sin and I listen and, and experience the Holy Spirit convicting me, I can go to Him and get that conflict removed in my relationship with God and walk in the power that He desires us to walk in. See, ultimately what it comes down to, it's not about us, it's about Jesus. It's always about Jesus, Amen. Reckon yourselves to be dead, indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. We're going to stop here. But I'm reminded of an illustration of what Paul speaks of here in Romans chapter 6 in the person of Lazarus. Remember Lazarus Lazarus in John chapter 11? And we know that Lazarus died, right? And how long was he in the tomb? Four days. And then Jesus, knowing that what he was going to do, he spoke forth and said, Lazarus, to come. And he did. He raised him from the dead. But you remember when Lazarus came out, he had what on? He had grave clothes. Sometimes our walk with the Lord Yes, we have been resurrected in the newness of life. But we get tangled up in our own grave clothes that's already been taken off of us. 
That's a picture of not only the wonderful power of God, but it also, again, reminds me that when we don't reckon ourselves dead to sin, when we allow and we follow the temptation and we, and, and we, we choose to sin, we put them grave clothes back on, and it gets heavy. What are we to do? We have a wonderful God that invites us to come to him. I know many people are struggling, believers, with temptation, with the heaviness of living in this life. Teenagers struggling, just trying to figure things out. What to do? What to do is to follow him, to be in his word and to trust him. The temptation, again, is to go other ways. I, I need this. I need that. We need to send them to there to see what can happen. But God says in his word, he has given us everything for life and godliness. We have been crucified with him, and we have been raised to the newness of life. We have his power. Amen? We have a wonderful week. Holy Week, it's an awesome week to be in the Scriptures, to go through every day to, to see what Jesus did that week. And we know that they rejected Him. Oh, they invited Him, right, on Palm Sunday, Hosanna, Hosanna, they invited Him in. Just a few short later, they cried out, crucify. But they didn't just crucify Him. Jesus willingly, knowingly went to that cross for all of us and for the world. And as if you're here this morning and you have never admitted that you're a sinner, you've never experienced the believing and confessing your sin before a holy, righteous God, then you, you're living in judgment. The Bible says that after death, judgment comes. There's no second chances after death. Today's your day. Confess your sin. Admit that you're a sinner. And experience the, the salvation that we, we, we looked at in the scriptures. If you've never done that, I want to talk with you after the service. But even so, more so importantly this morning, as a believer, maybe you have those grave clothes on. And I pray the Spirit of God speak into your heart. Come to Him. He'll take them off for you once again. He will love you. He will set you back on that path because he's faithful to his word. And he says, if you confess your sin, that he is faithful and just and able to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He's faithful. It's all about him. Amen. Would you stand with me as the worship team comes up? Oh, Father, we, we, we are so thankful for your word, and we are so thankful for your Holy Spirit to bring these truths to us, Lord, because we need to hear them, Lord. Lord, pray, I pray that you would help us to chew the cud, even this week, Lord. Just being reminded of what you've done for us. We rejoice in the cross. Lord Jesus, that demonstrating your love for us, that even while we were sinners, you, you died. But we also know that you were buried and you resurrected on the third day. And it's our wonderful hope, Lord Jesus, not only for eternity, but for this life here on earth, that we would live the resurrected life. And we fall short, Lord, and we need you. Lord, would you pour out your spirit upon these precious people and all your believers throughout the world, especially this week, God, in a special way, reminding us of how awesome you are and the mighty love that you have for us. And Lord, that we would truly live the resurrected life that you desire for us to live in that personal relationship with you. So Lord, Bless this people as we go. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.